Hi, my name is Dr. Sal Rappaport, and we're here with Judge Angie Arkin, and we're going to be talking to you today about alcohol monitoring and sustainable parenting time. I'm a licensed psychologist and board certified, and I focus and specialize in forensic psychology, uh, both in terms of conducting evaluations and consulting around the country uh, with attorneys. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Angie Arkin and I am a retired district court judge from Colorado. Uh, was on the bench for about 15 and a half years and a significant portion of that time was in domestic relations. Uh, so I will be talking to you with Dr. Rappaport about the use of alcohol monitoring and how important it is for it to keep kids safe during parenting time. So today, what we're gonna cover are several different topics. We're going to spend a little bit of time on how big of a problem is the alcohol, talking about why alcohol monitoring can be vital, as well as options for monitoring. We also are going to talk about planning for what happens an alcohol monitoring test comes back positive and also how to make sure that the court orders that are entered or the agreements that are made into court orders are effective in assuring that the alcohol monitoring technology is effective. There's some key facts about alcoholism that I think we're all somewhat familiar with, and so we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But approximately 15 million adults have alcohol use disorders in the United States alone. And that's only those we know of. Um, what's interesting is many people often think of alcohol use disorders as a primarily a male problem. And in fact, it is more common in men than women. But if you look at the statistics, you still have over 5 million women in this country with alcohol related issues. So it's not something that is not prevalent and highly prevalent in women as well. It's just more prevalent in men. We also know just from our own experiences is that very few people go into treatment for it. In fact, the literature suggests less than 10% actually get treatment. Those of you who have been involved in family law cases for any length of time have probably encountered individuals with alcohol challenges in your caseload. One of the things to be aware of and why it's so relevant in our family law cases is that about 10% of children live with a parent with alcohol problems. So amongst you know all the divorces that are going on in this country, we're talking about a lot of kids who are living with a parent where there's a serious alcohol issue. And one of the things that's interesting is that there's actually a much higher rate, and this will be no surprise, a higher rate of divorce in marriages where one parent is a heavy drinker. What's more interesting is if both parents are heavy drinkers, the divorce rate is the same as for the general population. The other challenge that kids have in these kinds of cases is they become essentially the parent, uh, caring for them, uh, doing the family chores. And then keep in mind, as you can see on the slide, about 55,000 divorce cases a year involve a parent who's abusing alcohol. So this is something that we see a lot of, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but it's not uncommon in divorce cases. One of the things that's interesting is that we're all aware that there's a variety of substances out there that people use and abuse. What I find most interesting is the most commonly used drug is alcohol, which is not a surprise. What I find interesting is that more people abuse alcohol than all other drugs combined. So why should we do alcohol monitoring is obviously an important question to ask. First and foremost, it's really about protecting the safety of the children. And when I talk about children's safety, I don't just mean their physical safety. I mean their emotional safety. As we'll talk a little bit later in one of the slides, there's a lot of literature out there about the negative impact on children of parents who are abusing and misusing alcohol. Um, as a forensic psychologist, and as I said earlier, my specialty is in family law. So I conduct a lot of child custody evaluations and consult with attorneys and review other custody evaluators' work. And one of the reasons I like alcohol monitoring is it gives me the ability when I'm not sure if there's really an alcohol-related problem, 
to put some protections in place for a child. Because what I don't want to do as an evaluator, and I don't think judges want to do this either, we don't want to expose a child to a parent who's actively abusing alcohol because there could be risk to them. But we also don't want to keep a child away from a parent if a parent is not abusing alcohol. And by having a monitoring system in place, it allows us to ensure that the parent and child can be together in a safe manner. Alcohol monitoring also can provide a consistent structure. Uh, most importantly, or one of the most important things is it takes away the ability of false accusations and weaponizing. Too often, uh, what we've seen is a parent shows up to pick up their child and the other parent accuses them, well, you've been drinking, I can smell it on your breath. And then they get in an argument in front of the child or they refuse to let the child go with the other parent. And what you end up is, is an argument that the child witnesses or you have a parent who suddenly doesn't let the child go with the other parent and that puts the child in the middle. By having a monitoring system which is electronic and goes through a company, it creates a situation where parents can't use it as a weapon or to create false accusations. And in fact, monitoring can be a great way to regain trust. If I'm that parent who shows up and I haven't been drinking, but my former spouse thinks I have been and won't let me take the child, how can I regain their trust back? One way is through alcohol monitoring. If they can see that I'm taking these tests and I'm passing it every time, they can then begin to trust that in fact, I'm not drinking anymore. One of the biggest challenges as a judge is trusting that the children will be safe with the parent you're sending them home with. And it becomes very, very concerning if you have someone who has uh, either allegations that are credible or some kind of evidence of consistent alcohol use. And you're trying to figure out whether or not this parent is going to be intoxicated when the children are in their care. As a judge, you're always going to be thinking first do no harm. So sending the children home without some kind of consistent alcohol monitoring is very, very concerning for the judicial officer because most judges, and I believe this is true all over the country, wear a hat, a parent's patre hat that requires them to keep the children safe at all times. So alcohol monitoring is an effective way of assuring that that happens. You know, you, Judge, you talked about um, not just protecting the children, but doing no harm. And it's very easy to, when we know someone's drinking, to keep children safe by keeping them away from a parent who's drinking. The reason why monitoring to me is so important is it goes the other way too. We don't want to harm a parent-child relationship by keeping a child away from a parent when they could be with them in a healthy manner. Actually, that is the most concerning and important dilemma that courts struggle with is is it more harmful, especially with very young children, to keep them away from a parent than it is uh, to keep them safe? And effective alcohol monitoring can meet both of those goals because for very young children, that attachment concern is very significant. Not seeing a parent or only seeing a parent for, for a limited amount of time is is very troubling and difficult for very young children. Uh, so alcohol monitoring can really be a, a huge positive step in allowing that continued contact, which is so important for kids. It's important to remember that alcoholism is a disease. Um, people sometimes forget that, to be honest with you they think of it as well they drink too much and they create it themselves and while they may have created it or helped create it themselves it is a disease and it's considered a disease and needs to be treated like a disease the important thing about alcohol monitoring is that it's not about blaming a parent that's not the reason we monitor that parent it's about protecting the children and the other thing is i'm sure you know is there's a high rate of relapse among alcoholism 
or with alcoholism. The relapse happens in over 70% of cases. That doesn't mean they go back to drinking and never recover again. As you've heard and have seen, there are several people who recover great. There's other people who begin to recover, start drinking again, recover again, and maybe in and out of treatment for the rest of their lives. And I've worked with some people who go into treatment two or three times, and after the second or third time, or even the first time, uh, they seem to do fine long term. So monitoring is something that can be put in place, which can help really protect children uh, throughout the process. And as you know, in family law cases, there seems to be two main things that we know. One is there are cases we can prove that there's an alcohol related issue, and then there's those that we can't prove. And the ones that we can prove and on the one sense are easier because we know it's a problem. We can put treatment recommendations in place and a monitoring system. And as the judge will talk about later, clear orders as to what to do when there's a positive test. The ones that are tricky, which to me are the more common ones that I see, are the ones where you can't prove it. Because the ones you can prove it often don't end up in custody evaluation, although they do sometimes, I've seen it before. But there's also those that you just can't prove. And those are the most challenging ones where a monitoring system can be put in place simply as a protection for the child and for as a way for the parent to show the court and their former spouse that in fact they aren't misusing alcohol. Part of why it's so difficult for the non-drinker, the non-user, to accept that the user has changed is because is for a few reasons. First of all, they don't live with them anymore, so they can't see the changes happening. They can only rely on what they've been saying. And one of the things we know about people with severe alcohol problems is they lie about it. Yes. So if they lied about it while they're living together, it's natural for the spouse who's not using to think the other person is still lying when they're not together. The other reason is that so many marriages end because of a lack of trust. Something happened that right. it made somebody not trust another person, whether it's marital infidelity, whatever it is. That what happens is, is if they can't trust them because they're getting divorced, they're sure not going to trust them around being honest about their alcohol use. So having a monitoring system that can show somebody that in fact there's evidence they are not drinking or they are drinking can really re begin to build that trust and create safety for the children at the same time. This is um, so critical in, in understanding what does and what doesn't work in the process of dissolution of marriage. Many people somehow think that the court is going to be able to fix the other person. That is so far from the truth. And the reality is that individuals who want to address their challenges are the only ones who can address their challenges. The court's job is to monitor that and to assure that the children are safe. But the court doesn't have the ability to change people, neither do the other parties in the case have the ability to change people or they wouldn't be separating. So the challenge becomes reasonable expectations and alcohol monitoring is an objective way to assure that the person is getting better if that's what they're committed to do. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what really is the impact on kids when they're living in a household with a parent who has a severe alcohol problem or someone who abuses alcohol significantly. Um, there's a lot of issues that go on for kids. They often have a fear of abandonment. Uh, many times they have higher levels of anxiety because they're fearful. Is their parent going to drink? Are they not? They often live in a home where there's less predictability, so things can be a little scarier. There's increased risk of other mental health problems for kids as well when you're living in a home with someone who's abusing alcohol. Uh, there's also kids develop a tendency to lie because they often cover up for their parents. They cover up with their friends, they cover up with siblings, they cover up with their other parent. And so it creates an atmosphere for children that is just not emotionally healthy. The concern also is many of these children aren't just covering up. They're also caring for the entire family. 
I have had more cases than I would care to remember where the six, seven or eight year old is cooking, is caring for their siblings, is getting the kids off to school, is doing things that are just shockingly adult because their parent, often a single parent in a separated household or a parent who is supposed to be the caregiving parent is incapacitated. So these kids are going to need a lot of help to recover from these situations, some kind of a therapeutic uh, plan that will help them move forward as well as the parent. But this is a huge and significant concern about the impact of a parent's alcohol challenge on children. There's also a greater risk of intimate partner violence or domestic violence when you have a parent who's abusing alcohol. So one of the other risks to children is that they may become the witness of domestic violence. And we know there's a great deal of literature on the harmful effects that has on children. And not just children who visually see it, but children who hear it and are aware of it. Because as much as parents think they keep things away from their kids, we all know that kids are, kids are pretty perceptive and kids pick up on things. Kids often know their parent has an alcohol problem even when their parent doesn't admit it. And because there's so much denial with alcohol related issues, it's not something that is typically talked about in the household. And so the kids do need a safe place to talk about it when it's clear that there's a problem. But ultimately, we want people to get better. We want people not to abuse alcohol because that's where you're going to create the better, healthy, uh, you know, parent-child relationships. I have met with a number of children over the years who have talked to me about their parents' alcohol challenges. And I would say that meeting with a judge is not therapeutic for kids and it's not a positive experience but sometimes kids have a need to tell somebody what's really happening in their household and um, it's it's pretty pretty problematic and very challenging and these children are going to really struggle unless they get some really good help to get through this and move forward from it. Uh, and that is an enormous part of it. Turning kids into witnesses so that they can talk about what's going on with their alcoholic parent is the most damaging way to get evidence of alcoholism. Sometimes it's absolutely essential, but boy, would I prefer to have had alcohol monitoring in the cases where kids talk to me? Absolutely. In fact, alcohol monitoring for the parent is in many ways a treatment strategy as well as a monitoring strategy. Because adults so often are in denial about their alcohol related problems that it's not till it's kind of shoved in their face right. that they may realize, oh, I really have to do something about this. And alcohol monitoring is a way to shove it in their face and to basically say, look, you've been testing positive. You said you weren't drinking. And if you're testing positive, you can't be with your kids. And if you're choosing to do that, what does that really say about the level of your alcohol related problem? So it actually monitoring can actually help be a wake up call for some parents as well. Judge, do you want to go on and talk about some of the options for alcohol monitoring in the next the first option that's listed on this slide is supervised parenting time. And anyone who's had experience with supervised parenting time knows that for many parents, it's quite expensive. Uh, for especially lower income folks, it, you know, if your community doesn't have a low income option for supervised parenting time, it really is cost prohibitive. It's very hard to have a normalized relationship with your child when essentially you are being watched. And in some of these cases, the monitoring requires that uh, either somebody watches everything or somebody accompanies the child with the parent at all times. So it 
there really isn't any privacy, it's invasive, it's expensive, and most people can't afford a significant amount of time with their children, which again is very problematic, especially for younger kids. It is a necessary option in situations where you're trying to get some kind of handle on the problem. It is, supervised parenting time should generally be looked at as an interim step. It should not be something that's long-term. The only time you're gonna want supervised parenting time long-term is if you have someone who has a significant alcohol problem and is absolutely unwilling to maintain sobriety with any significant consistency. And in those situations, long-term supervised parenting time may be the only opportunity for parenting for that parent. But it certainly isn't a long-term, a, a good long-term option for most families. Uh, random or schedule ETG or PETH testing. You know, the, the biggest challenge with these things is that the results are not immediate. Uh, it takes a while for you to get the results, sometimes uh, 24 hours, sometimes a week. Uh, it can be very, very problematic. So um, the other part of it is that the parent often has to do the testing perhaps while they have the children with them. They have to figure out how to seclude themselves or leave the kids for a period of time to go get tested. That's problematic. Um, so it, it, all of those things. And the other part of it is you, you get notification that it's time for you to be tested. If you're a parent who travels, if your work schedule is very uh, rigorous, it's very hard to meet the schedule for the random testing. From my standpoint, one of the problems with the ETG and PETH testing, and particularly ETG, is it has a fairly high false negative rate. In other words, there's a lot of people who have been drinking, but it doesn't show up in the test. The ignition interlock really was created for people who drive drunk. And even in some situations where now they use a camera to determine who's blowing into the ignition interlock, whereas uh, a lot of people used to ask their kiddo or uh, some other person to blow into the device because it wasn't being filmed. Even in those situations, all these systems really do is keep people from driving their, their children while they're under the influence of alcohol. A parent who's under the influence of alcohol isn't going to be a great parent whether they're driving their kids or not. And these ignition interlock systems really are about drunk driving and were developed for the criminal courts. They're not terribly effective in the family court context. So ankle bracelets uh, are problematic also because they're not really easy to hide. And especially in the summertime uh, or in states where people wear shorts, there's this thing around mom or dad's ankle uh, that they have to explain to the kids. And that's not always something simple. These devices often are very expensive for the individual. They're often used for probation, but they can be very cost problematic for, for individuals. In addition, the results from these ankle monitors are not real time. It takes a while for those results to come in, sometimes up to a week. That is very concerning. If I have a parent who drank the week before, but the kids are with them half the time, that is from my perspective, unacceptable. It's dangerous for those children. Breathalyzers that are over-the-counter breathalyzers. So the first challenge with these is chain of custody. How do I know as the court that the result that someone blew into the breathalyzer 
is in fact reliable. Uh, how do I know that the person used the device properly? How do I know that? But it also creates another problem for the child because now you have one parent who's kind of in control and says, I want you to blow into this before you take, you know, little Johnny or little Susie for the weekend. And first of all, that doesn't tell you anything about what the other parent does during the entire weekend. It only tells you whether they were drinking just before the pickup time. But it creates a situation where it gives a parent too much control to now say, well, you can't take the child now. And the child's sitting there already waiting to go with that other parent, and now they can't go. So it just puts the child in the middle of something and gives a parent a little too much control that they shouldn't have in regards to that relationship and how to move forward around these alcohol related issues. That is such a common situation. And often the parent who is the quote unquote monitor is pretty angry and unhappy about the entire situation and may have some challenges honoring the other parent's presence in the children's lives. So their motives aren't necessarily pure. And so it's very easy to manipulate a device like this or uh, this methodology of alcohol monitoring. So yes, that's a serious problem. That brings us to Soberlink, but Soberlink what it does is it monitors the other parent real time so you can set it up so that when the parent is parenting they are in a constant monitoring system that allows the children to remain safe but also allows the children to remain with the parent who is challenged with alcohol so long as they are remaining sober and that monitoring does not involve any sort of direct interaction. So that's a huge plus because that minimizes the conflict and it's also a consistent level of comfort for the parent who is concerned about the alcohol challenge. One of the nice things about the Soberlink system from my standpoint is that the results can go to other people than just the parents. So it can be set up to go to the GAL or the attorney for the child. So there can be an outside person also getting those results as well. What I really like about Soberlink is in addition to the results being sent real time to the other party or to whoever is designated to receive those results, there is facial recognition technology being used to verify that the individual who's taking the test is in fact the person who's supposed to be monitored. And if there's a challenge to the test, then that picture can be shown to the court to verify, in fact, it was the individual who was supposed to be tested. One of the things that I hear from parents all the time is, well, he or she'll drink after 10 o'clock at night after the last test, and then nobody will know. And the answer is yes. The Soberlink system can pick it up the next morning. And what happens is with the Soberlink monitoring system is if you get a positive test result, you wait 15 minutes and do it again. And if it comes back as zero, then it might have been a false positive. But you can keep taking it every 15 minutes up to about six times, which means in the morning, if you see the numbers positive each time but dropping, that's clear evidence they were drinking late the night before and it's just now getting out of their system completely. The other thing I like about Soberlink, as you kind of mentioned, is the facial monitoring. One of the great things about the way the facial monitoring works is it takes a picture and it goes to a computer and analyzes it right away to determine if it's the person. But if it doesn't come up as a match, it then goes to a live person who can look at the picture and see if it matches the picture they have in the Soberlink computer system. And I was involved with a case, and I told the judge about this, where one of the tests came back where it wasn't a recognition match. So a live person looked at the picture. And what the live person saw was someone standing behind them with a tube. And the tube was coming over their shoulder. So this other person was trying to blow into the device. And 
the a live person from Soberlink actually could pick that up and see that it wasn't the actual parent blowing into the device. So it's a really great technology. Well, and I actually had a case where the opposite was true. The other parent was claiming that the person blowing into the device was not their spouse. And Soberlink confirmed that even though the picture was very dark, it was indeed the individual who was supposed to be blowing into the device. So that extra backup can be very helpful on either side of the uh, high conflict situation. So as we move to the next slide, we want to talk a little bit about how to use the system. How many times should they be tested? When I first became aware of this device, my assumption was you want random testing rather than schedule testing right. because that's going to catch somebody. And what the data from Soberlink shows is, in fact, schedule testing detects it just as well as randomized testing. Uh, so you don't really need to have random testing. Schedule testing works well. Typically, you want two to three tests per day. But if you really think there's someone at high risk, or you really think someone's hiding or lying about it, you might want to do four tests in high risk cases. You can obviously do that for a few months. And if the tests are all negative after three months or six months, you could go to three tests a day or two tests a day. You typically want to test for a minimum of one year. So if you're starting with four tests, I don't object to going down to three at six months. Uh, but the other thing is we said uh, from talking before is a lot of tests come up positive in the morning. In fact, Soberling's data suggests that 90% of their positive tests are actually in the morning, not in the afternoon or at night. So if people are trying to get away with it by drinking after their last test at night, and Soberlink is picking it up in the morning. One of the keys to how to determine what's most appropriate in any given case is going to be, what is this person's challenge? What is their history of alcohol use or abuse? If this is one of those situations where we really don't have any history that is proven, probably you're looking at maybe three times a day initially to determine whether or not there really is a challenge that is consistent or concerning. If what you have is someone who's been in and out of treatment for some significant period of time and has a real history of alcohol use, that's going to be the four test a day kind of parent and you're also going to want to be looking at other forms of treatment that this individual needs to be having at the same time that they're doing the alcohol monitoring. Otherwise, the monitoring itself is not going to be effective. But if you don't have someone who has a serious and significant history, four times a day may be setting that person up to be very, very resistive to participating in this, uh, in this alcohol monitoring. And frankly, I have found as a judge and also as a mediator that people's willingness to participate in this monitoring is a significant indicator of success if there's going to be success. If you have someone who's kicking and screaming the entire time, then you may have to litigate the issue and that may just cause significantly greater conflict and of course, significantly greater cost for that family related to the litigation. Also with the scheduled test versus, random, versus randomized tests, uh, one of the things I like about the scheduled test is it can reduce parent stress. Going through a divorce or being involved with the family court system is stressful in and of itself. We know that people feel more in control when there's predictability. And so if it's scheduled and they know when it is, then they can set up their daily schedule around it. So they don't have to suddenly say, excuse me from a meeting to go get tested. They can try to set up their schedule so that it can be done privately and so that it's less intrusive in their lives. So there's really some a lot of advantages to having scheduled tests. One of the things that everybody needs to think through is thinking about what the options should be and how you want to deal with that Mr. Positive test. 
it, it is something that's absolutely essential. And keep in mind that if someone tests positive, they are going to have to take another test in 15 minutes. Because if someone, for example, just used mouthwash, you could get a positive test result with Soberlink. But that's going to be out of your mouth within a couple of minutes. So what Soberlink has set up that if you have a positive result, you then take it again in 15 minutes to see if in fact there's still alcohol in your system. If 15 minutes later it comes up as zero, then clearly that could have been a mouthwash issue. But if it comes up positive, that's two tests in a row that are positive, that's not going to be mouthwash. Right. And that is, again, one of the things that Soberlink offers that other kinds of monitoring do not, because there is this sort of self uh, authenticating part of Soberlink that is trying to assure that those claims that uh, it's a false positive are minimized. And I think, as I recall the technology, that is something that Soberlink has really addressed over time as a way to make this system even more um, more certain in terms of the results. And, and again, if you're the court and you are looking at keeping children safe and you want that level of uh, certainty related to the children's safety, that's a big positive that Soberlink does its own sort of backup testing to assure that the results are in fact what they appear to be. When you are negotiating an agreement related to this, whether it's through counsel or through mediation or whether the court is entering orders, it's very important that not only do you set forth what the testing methodology is going to be, but all of the aspects of what you are intending so that it works. Because the worst thing that can happen in these situations is that people come into the courtroom or people go to mediation and they set up a monitoring system that by its own terms is ineffective. Mediation is also generally not inexpensive. It is an opportunity for you to address the challenge right then. So the first thing that you need to do is decide which test you're going to use. And as I previously mentioned, from my perspective, I'm not aware of anything that's going to allow the, on, the consistent on-time real-time monitoring that Soberlink offers, but there are other testing methodologies. It's very important for you to know not only which test you're going to be using, but when does the monitoring need to take place? So is there going to be supervised parenting time until the monitoring begins? And if so, what's that going to look like? When does the monitoring need to begin? And I always believe in putting dates in specifically. So you have seven days to get this in place or, or some specific period of time for the monitoring to begin. Which party is going to pay for it? Often in these situations, the person who has the alcohol challenge is the one who has to pay for the monitoring. But sometimes, especially in divorce cases, you have a party who doesn't have any income or it, who is going to school or ramping up their income. And so there's a, uh, especially when you have a parent who's a very engaged, involved parent, but that's the alcohol challenged parent, um, you don't want them to be struggling with the cost. So you want to make sure that you address who's going to pay for the device, who's going to pay for the testing itself, how is that cost going to be apportioned. In addition to the start date, you want to talk about frequency in these orders and you want to talk about if there's going to be a step down. So I have always found, and I know that Saul is significantly more educated in 
dealing with folks with alcohol challenges. But I have always found that if you say someone with a serious challenge is going to be at four times a day, and you say, but after six months, it goes to three times a day, that incentivizes that person to get a handle on their issues and to get some help and to uh, see some light at the end of the tunnel. Similarly, saying uh, someone who starts with three times a day, that at some point they get to two times a day. And then there's a point where if that person is abstaining and all the tests are negative, that that person would eventually get to a place where the monitoring was discontinued. And Soberlink suggests a year, uh, if someone has a serious alcohol challenges, a year is probably the minimum amount of time that monitoring should take place, but certainly a year would be important. So, you also, sorry, you also want any orders on this topic, Judge, are the, is, is a statement about if there's a positive result, it resets how many more months or years until you reduce the number of tests. Most of the orders that I've entered and most of the agreements that people negotiate, that's exactly what happens. So uh, it goes to supervised parenting time for some period of time, and then they get back on the testing, and then it's like they've started all over again. And what we were talking about earlier with the relapse, that is, again, so important because it really is when you have a 70% expectation that it, there's going to be a relapse, you really need to build into the agreement or order what's going to happen when that relapse occurs. Because if you don't, then it can actually be more expensive and lead to some significant chaos. And again, some challenges with respect to restricting those children's access to their parent, which if the parent is sober and safe, is very problematic for those kids. And so, what you need to keep in mind is, is we're not just talking about having in the order information about what happens to the parent who failed a test or has a positive test, but also what treatment they have to go into. Because what you don't want to do is now have to go back into court and fight about what the treatment process is. So if you can ahead of time have in those orders and agreements, what's going to happen treatment wise, such as the person's going to go into a rehab facility or AA or some other treatment program, uh, that can be written into the order ahead of time. So that way you can say, gee, you had a positive result. You now have to do this in order to move away from supervised parenting time. So it's now not just about not having negative results, but also what treatment they have to enter to increase the likelihood that they will maintain their sobriety. I also think you want to make sure that we also protect some information for the sub substance user. Absolutely. That is, not everything from their treatment has to be disclosed to the court or to a GAL or to whomever. But really what needs to be disclosed is are they in treatment, are they attending regularly, and are they making progress? I think that as a user, someone isn't going to want to all their detailed information about their life open up to the court, childhood issues, whatever it may be. So there's some information that I think under HIPAA can still remain private and they can say we're not going to release that but the substance user can agree to release certain information as I had indicated. It is absolutely in everyone's interest in this picture, the child's, the parents, the other parents, and frankly, the courts. It's absolutely in everyone's interest for this person to be successful. And if they are not allowed to have some privacy and some ability to benefit from the therapy and to move forward in their life, it will not be successful. And that hurts everyone. So absolutely building in some level of therapeutic privacy and ability to achieve a positive result, that is a win-win for all of us. On behalf of Judge Arkin and myself, we thank you and hope you enjoyed this.